What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over Projectiles and Special Moves Part 3. Now, this is Part 3 of, you know, this sub-series within the fighting game tutorial series. And we'll have a ton more of these. I'll probably be sprinkling these throughout different, uh, different harder topics like AI and networking. So you'll probably just see these videos popping up quite a lot. This is the last one I'll be doing for now, you know, for, for a few episodes at least. But I want to do this one because I, I'm trying to get rid of all the requested videos first before I hop into some more complicated topics. So I'm also trying to work on some stuff in the background so I always have content to give you guys even when I'm on a more complex topic that could take longer than a week or if I happen to have less time that week. So anyway, you'll see some more of these popping up. So if you have special moves in particular that you'd like me to cover, let me know. In this case, we want to cover a homing projectile. Now you can customize it completely to your liking. I'll show you what mine looks like. Mine goes into the air and then targets the player. Now specifically with this attack, it actually targets them the entire time. So you can see if I stand really close to the enemy, then the projectile goes basically straight down because it, it starts targeting me and then tries to tries to stay true to that. Now you can actually see it starts to come back up so if I go like this and I were to jump over it, in that case it actually hit me because the hitbox is not really true to the jump right now. I have not updated it along with the other states. But see how I jumped over it? It actually comes up toward the end. You can see that it's it's trying to track the player. So you can actually determine how strong the tracking is on this homing projectile. You can determine its logic. Like you don't have to shoot it straight up. It can be, uh, you can spawn it in the scene in a specific location. You can spawn it from really anywhere. You can control how high it goes up, and you can control if it hits the ground or wall, will it blow up? We'll also be covering a few other fixes for projectiles. Like for example, for the fireball. You can see that it did not hit the enemy. The enemy jumped over it, but we still blew up when it collided with the wall, and we also destroyed it. That is up to you if you want to implement that, but we are going to cover it. That way projectiles can always be destroyed when they collide with other objects as well. This will also help us with our memory issues that we were having, well, that we could have in the future. Alrighty, so let's get started. Today's episode is honestly pretty easy. Just another fun one where we have to figure out exactly how we want to configure our attack. You guys probably know this by now, but I'm still going to cover it, as with every episode. First things first, if you haven't seen any other episode in this tutorial series, I believe we're episode 62 at this point. We're very far along. So if you'd like to catch up on all the awesome stuff that we've been able to do so far, I will leave a link in this icon in the top right corner right here to the fighting game playlist. You can check out all the episodes from there. I'll also leave an iCard to the projectile, the first projectile episode, because we're going to be using a lot of that from, a lot of the logic from that episode and from part two to do this one. So just like with the fireball and the the tornado that I called the rising tornado, I go ahead and I make a command, um, the same way I do all the other commands. So basically, in the character that I want to add this command to, specifically the mutant character in this case. Then I go ahead and I update the number of commands that we have. Now we've got six commands and then I set all the logic for each command. So character commands index five. Remember it starts at index zero. That's command six. We set the name to be homing thunderball. I've added inputs for CVC. That is the actual um, way to implement this command and to perform this command in the game. Remember, I said in the last episode, this will be updated soon to be using action mappings. So both player one and player two can use it. And also, it won't be assigned to a specific key or button. It'll be assigned to the action mapping. So it'll be a lot easier to perform and transfer between keyboard and controller, things like that. But it's as simple as that. Just add it here so that we know what our command is. Let's go into Unreal. And we'll do the basic stuff that we always do. Let's go to our NMBP. We can go to the, the state machine. Right click, add a new state, and we add the homing thunderball. 
Make sure that the animation is not looping and get an animation that you're happy with. So this is my animation. I've added an anim notify called spawn homing thunderball. The same way that I have like spawn fireball, spawn rising tornado. Um, the transition rules are the same as all the other commands. So you can see it's not automatic to get there. What we have to do is grab the character commands um, array from the mutant character reference, get the index of the specific command that has to be true for us to actually go to that state and then uh, use that boolean to make sure that we can enter. It's gonna be the same for all of these, but I'll just show you. Index five, that's the one that homing thunderball is on and has used command. Easy enough. And of course the logic going back is also easy enough. For this, we always use automatic rule based. But we do need to have end command transition at the end of these, as always. So from command back to idle, which is what we're on, they're automatic rule based with the start transition event of end command transition. Also going into the command, I always have start attack transition. These are just to you know, stop the player from being able to move while performing this command, spawn the hitboxes, different things like that. Simple enough. So now we can go ahead and start creating our logic for our homing thunderball. The logic here is not too bad, especially if you follow the other projectile tutorials. For example, the spawn fireball and notify that we have will basically cover what we need to do today. Um, well, the majority of the changes will be in the homing thunderball class, but if you go to where your spawn fireball is, you can actually copy all this logic and then paste it down somewhere below. Grab your anim notify, you can just type spawn homing. And of course, whatever your name is, yours doesn't have to be homing thunderball. I just thought that was a, you know, it sounds like something a fighting game would have. And you can paste your logic. If I paste it right side by side, you'll see that they're very, very similar. So we're grabbing the player transform and the mutant character reference. Then the actor we're spawning will be different. It will be the projectile homing, whatever, uh, you call your class, then you can change any data you want on the actual object. Like I've made this object not pushback or a launch, but I made the hit stun blocks on time really long, so it's kind of like it shocks the enemy. But there's no, you know, nothing uh, I've done here is actually important to th this tutorial, so you can make it whatever you want. And then I spawn projectile. So you can literally copy it change your data and change the class type and you're basically good to go. Now before we go any farther we need to make sure that we can spawn the correct class type. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and go to our projectiles. And all I do is I right click on the default projectile BP. This happens to be the fireball but it doesn't really matter. Just whatever your default projectile is is good we can create child blueprint class and essentially we're going to make the default homing projectile. You see the way I'm setting this up is I have a default projectile and then I have a default like this is up from ground. So basically a default projectile that spawns on the enemy and then a default projectile that homes into the enemy. So I call this proj underscore homing. Now it's still a child of the default projectile. So the default projectile has spawn projectile and I'm adding a new custom event called force destroy. So you may want to do this. Whatever events you have in the default projectile will be able to be accessed in children. So even if you don't use it in the parent, you can still have access to it. So add custom event, call it force destroy. Now we don't have to change anything with the, the default projectile settings. But we do have to go into our project homing and define the logic we want. So none of this will be in here to start. Even with it being a child, everything is just automatically inherited. So we have access to this event, but without overriding it, without putting in our own data, it'll just do the same basic stuff that the parent was doing. We don't want that. So grab your spawn projectile event. And here's the logic we can fill out. 
This one's a little bit different. So we're not just spawning it and having it go in the space. Specifically what I wanted to do with it is have it rise up for a bit and then home into the player. So to perform that action, the easiest way to do that is to spawn it, give it a velocity of straight Z, and then set it to be homing in Unreal settings and give it the, the correct velocity to do so. Now, first things first, let's make sure that the owner of this projectile is a fighter template character. Because we're going to need the fighter template character to know what object we're targeting. Uh, basically, you know, if player one throws this, we're going to need to know what object to home into. So we're going to need other player. And specifically, the way Unreal's homing system works, because a lot of this is done in Unreal. There are some things that we have to do, like we have to set the velocities correctly, but we can actually set it to be homing and what object to target, and then you can change everything about the homing projectile to focus in on that object and move in a way that makes it move the way you want to. Okay, so um, once you've succeeded with this cast, then we need to set the velocity of the projectile. Now, velocity is a variable that we have in our default projectile BP. So even though you don't see it on the list here, you will have access to it. Just type in velocity and it will come up. You're gonna get that. Now before I had it as, I think I had it as negative 800. Yeah, 800. And then I was changing it based on the, the direction we were facing. But now I have my velocity as 400 on the Z. Not not 800 on the Y like it started, but 400 on the Z. So the Z is the up up and down axis in this case. So 400 velocity to be rising up into the air after the mutant uses the attack, that's the velocity, that's the way it's gonna move. I actually have a delay here with a delay time variable. Now you don't have to use a delay. Uh, this is one of the cases where I think a delay is actually perfectly fine because this is more specific case. This is where we, you know, we're defining the logic for an attack. So there's no real issue here with using a delay except you'll have to come change the delay time on this projectile, which I think is more than perfectly fine. But you, if you don't like using a delay for whatever reason, you could continue using uh, set velocity in local space. You could let it uh, slow down over time using, you, you could do either a lerp, you could do a timeline to slow it down over time. Once it stops, you could start homing. You could also just completely override the velocity um, over time with this this set velocity in local space. You could continuously update the velocity value and once it reaches the value you want passing the velocity. You could set the homing target component to be kind of on and off so you know one moment it's targeting the right actor and then it starts targeting say the ground or something. You know sometimes there's like those where it's partially homing. You have a lot of options here for things you could do. What I did, because quite frankly, I think it's the easiest, and yet I think it's very practical, is I've added a variable, I made it a float, and I've called it delay time. So here's delay time, and I'm passing it into the duration of the delay. It's that simple. In this case, I made delay time 0 0.3 seconds, so you can change it to be whatever you want. It could be 5 seconds, it could be you know, two minutes, whatever you want. Makes no difference. This is all up to you. Then once that delay is complete, I actually go ahead and reset the velocity to be completely zero. So it's not moving at this point. The reason I do this is because the homing projectile that Unreal has does take velocity into account. So if you have a certain speed that you're using, you have to be careful that the homing projectile can actually, you know, overcome that velocity that is on your projectile. If you set the speed to be zero on the X, Y, and Z like I've done here, then, I mean, the homing projectile has no velocity to overcome, so we can do it without issue. All you gotta do is grab your projectile movement and call a set velocity in local space. Same way you do it here. Now, in our projectile movement component, we have a few things we can do. I mean, you have all these variables you can change, and a lot of these are really important to making your perfect projectile. But one thing in particular that we need to change that I changed directly 
in the class defaults here as opposed to the graph for no particular reason, just because I didn't feel it was necessary to set it in this. I, I'll probably come in here every time and change it for each individual homing projectile, which is the reason I didn't feel like it was necessary to set in the graph, but it is up to you. However you'd like to set it up, you could make another variable just like I did with the delay time here and pass it in. The magnitude of our acceleration toward the homing target, overall velocity of magnitude will still be limited by max speed. So here you go. This is the magnitude of our acceleration. So this is how fast it will go toward the, um, the target. And this will also kind of determine how spot on it is. So if it's really fast, its acceleration is going to be really good at getting it into the correct spot that it needs to be to go toward the target. So if I make this 300, we can test it out. You'll see what I'm talking about. You saw 100. That was my default. This is going to be 300. Ready, fight. So I can use it, and it's going to speed up really quickly. Not only is it going to speed up quickly, though, but it's also going to be able to track the player a little bit better. I mean, you can see the player did not jump until toward the end. I can perform the command. And yet, the Thunderball almost... He actually goes and hits the wall. It doesn't even hit the ground. Because his acceleration is good enough when he sees a change in where it's got a track, then it can actually track the other character properly and in time. So a lot of this is up to you, what you want to do. I kind of like the slower version because you can use it and then go combo and it goes and hits them, which I thought was a little cool mechanic. And then I just set, I uh, use the projectile movement again to set is homing projectile to be true so drag off and literally type is homing projectile set it to be true that way it tracks the player but it needs something to track so specifically in this case we're going to track the other player it requires a scene component and the capsule component is a scene component you could also use the hurt box which I mean, it could be the, the right thing to do, but to be completely honest, I don't think it'll matter. The capsule component should always be around the same area as the hurt boxes. Uh, the capsule component is used for the actual collision. Remember, the hurt boxes are used for overlaps to check those types of collisions. So I don't think it's a problem to use the capsule component here, but if for whatever reason it is, you can use a hurt box as a scene component, but you will need to actually convert it to that. You may even need to perform a cast to make it work, to be able to plug it in. So off the character, I cast the other player, I grab the capsule component, and then I pass that into the homing target component. The projectile movement is the target here. And at that point, we're looking pretty good for this projectile. We're not done yet, though. We need to make some adjustments in our collision checks for the hitbox actor BP. And I also want to fix up something real quick in our Rising Tornado projectile. So we were using a timeline to create this, this tornado and have it rise from the ground. And that's good. But when we were finishing, we were just destroying the tornado. And we weren't really destroying anything with the hitboxes. Now the hitboxes were working before because I was just adding them to the active hitbox list. And they were eventually being destroyed over time. We don't really want that though. If they're being destroyed over time, then we won't be able to keep them in play for as long as we want using our same logic that we already have. So to make this a little bit better, what I've done is I've, remember the force destroy event that we made in the default projectile BP? You can grab this now. Okay. And then call that, instead of destroy actor, when the timeline is finished, call force destroy. And then you can see the logic I'm doing here. I'm getting all attached actors, looping through them. Casting to see if there's an attached hitbox actor to this projectile. If so, destroy that actor. And then once that actor has been destroyed, I'm destroying the projectile itself. And that will stop uh, your hitboxes from despawning too early for your rising tornado and those types of projectiles. We do need to fix up a few more things in the hitbox actor BP as well, like I said. One final thing before we do that. In the create projectile hitbox, I've actually changed over the active hitboxes to an array called projectile hitboxes. So I've made a new variable, and you can see it's of type hitbox actor BP. It's just an array of projectile hitboxes. Actually, it's just an array of active hitboxes, which are the hitbox actor BPs. But 
I've called it projectile hitboxes because the only time we ever add to it is in the create projectile hitbox. Now, right now, we're not actually clearing this out at all, so it's not gonna really matter if you add these to the array or not. I just wanted to get them out of the active hitboxes array so they don't automatically get cleared over time and when we return to idle and things like that. Again, these can remain later. You know, any, any hitboxes that can remain after an attack, we don't wanna clear. So you could either tag the, the hitbox or you could set them to a different array. But in this case, I think projectile hitboxes are super important, so they deserve their own array anyway. All right, and then let's go into our hitbox actor BP. Now, some of the most important logic in this episode is in this function. We already had a lot of it done, but we do need to we need to do a few things because we we missed some important elements last time. So let's go over the whole thing really quickly. First of all, on component begin overlap of hitbox display. So once the display of the hitbox is collided with, whether it be from a projectile, whether it be from a, a, just a regular attack, we need to make sure that we're hitting a hurtbox, which we did last time. In this case, I'm checking a projectile um, hurtbox, or excuse me, a projectile hitbox, seeing if the object that it's colliding with is a hurtbox, getting the owner and getting the character from it. So basically we're determining if this character and the owner of the projectile hitbox are not equal, and if they're not equal, then we want to have that character take damage. Basically, the enemy that has not spawned the projectile has been hit by the projectile, thus they need to take damage. And that makes sense. But we were never doing anything on false of this hurtbox actor BP. So if this projectile collided with something other than a hurtbox, we would not do any logic for it. Well, we want it to blow up at some point. I mean, regardless, we need to clean it up for memory reasons, if nothing else. So we should cast, on cast failed, still destroy the, the actor. We still had a collision here. Now, not all projectiles need to be destroyed upon collision. For example, you may not want to destroy the rising tornado or those types of attacks on collision. So we can set those, those projectiles individually and make them work. In this case, we're gonna do cast failed and we're gonna bring it all the way around after the take damage function. So yes, it skips all the take damage because it wasn't a wasn't a hurtbox collision, but we still wanna do all the other logic in this event down here. Okay, so that was all stuff we've done last episode. Let's keep going. Now he's getting attached parent actor. So remember the hitbox is attached to the projectile. So getting attached parent actor here is getting the projectile. I make sure that it's valid. And then I'm setting the collision to be false. At this point, I don't want the projectile to collide again by accident since you know it can collide more than once. Remember, doing this will stop the rising tornado from hitting the opponent more than once. And that is something you may have to address. You may need to only do this on actors that um, should be destroyed upon collision. I mean, that's kind of the reason we made the variable. But I'm okay with the Rising Tornado only landing one hit per use. So that's perfectly fine. Then we do our cast to our default projectile. I mean, we know that it is a projectile because that's that's what this is attached to if it's a projectile type. However, we need to cast it regardless to grab the variables from it. Now, the only other small change here is at the end of this logic. So we still check for should display hit and then we spawn the emitter at location if we should display hit. But what we weren't doing before is we weren't checking the next box, the next branch, if should display hit was false. We we're actually just leaving the logic alone, which we don't want to do. Even if we don't want to display hit, doesn't mean we shouldn't destroy the actors and things like that. So if it's false, bring it down below, and go to the next branch where we check should be destroyed upon collision. If it should be, then we destroy the projectile actor first, since we're in the hitbox actor. We destroy the projectile actor first. You can see this is the projectile blue line right here. And we call destroy actor on that. Then I check is actor being destroyed. And as long as it's not already being destroyed, we destroy the hitbox actor as well. The reason I'm checking this is now we're destroying hitboxes in multiple locations. The rising tornado, we have a force destroy event and uh, any other projectile we add could also have a force destroy event. If it's already being destroyed and you try to destroy it, it'll actually give you an error. It can even cause a crash depending on if you're what configuration you're in, and that's obviously not good. So we should check and make sure it's not being destroyed before destroying it. 
All right, there we go, guys. So that's how you can create homing projectiles and just really homing attacks in general in your fighting game tutorial series. I'm very excited for all the different attacks we can do. Again, just leave your ideas below or email them to me or whatever if there's specific attacks that you would like me to make. These are a ton of fun to make, and they're really great episodes in between more complicated episodes. So I can kind of know uh, what sort of things I can work on that are fun and that can really improve our games, but they're not too difficult. We just have to think about how we want to create them and what options we have while creating these attacks. If you enjoyed this video and it helped you create your specific type of projectile or attack that you want to do, then please subscribe. It does more for me than anything else you can do. It's free and I just really appreciate it. I'd like to give a huge shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon subscribers and supporters. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for believing in me and continuing to support the series. I really, really appreciate it. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of the tutorials in the series, feel free to join the Discord community. The link is in the description and we can get you sorted with any of the problems that you're having. <clears throat> Lastly guys, if you want to come support us on Twitch or if you want to see programming live streams, we got all sorts of, of different options here. So we make these videos every Friday and Sunday, there's a new one released. But I also stream Friday night for a programming live stream right here on this channel. And I upload all my streams, programming and gaming streams, to the Sean the Road 27 YouTube channel. Fight. So if you want to check them out after the live stream, then you can check them out right here in this iCard to that channel. Alright, guys. That's all I got for you today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.